You're listening to the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, you'll hear part one of my full birth story recorded with my husband, Josh. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm your host, Laura Schoenfeld, a registered dietitian, nutrition business coach, and online entrepreneur with over 10 years of experience in online business. And I'm here to show you everything I've learned about creating a life and a business that nourishes you. On this podcast, we'll talk about the lifestyle habits, practical strategies, mindset shifts, and leaps of faith required to build a healthy body, a powerful mind, a strong spirit, and a successful business. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, your host as always, and I have a special guest with us today, my husband, Joshua. Say hi, hey. Josh. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Um, so this is our first, well, I shouldn't say our first, this is our first ever recording together. And it's my first recording back after like two months off, um, from attorney leave. So I'm super excited to be chatting with you guys. And, um, today we're actually going to be talking about our birth story. So the reason why I wanted to share this with you all is because there was a lot of stuff that I learned during the birth process that is something I'll definitely apply in the future if we have another child, but also it's just something that I think was um, kind of indicative of challenges that I struggle with in daily life or normal life that just got enhanced during the, you know, intensity and and stress of childbirth. Um, So it was something that after thinking about it and processing it and talking with Josh about it, I think we discovered some things that we learned about ourselves and about, you know, just our relationship that came up during the birth experience and um, thought we would share those lessons with you. Also, if you're somebody who is thinking about having kids and has never had a baby before, or maybe you had a baby, but your birth experience wasn't what you wanted it to be, my hope is that some of the stuff we share today can help you have the best possible experience with your birth since, um, as you guys will find out, my goal from day one was to have an unmedicated birth, and I was able to do that. So if that's something that you want to do, then I hope that the stuff that we share is going to be helpful for you. Um, Now, we do have our daughter, Vera, in the room with us. She's being bounced (laughs) on the floor over here. So you may hear her when we're talking, which, you know, I'm hoping that just enhances the experience because now it's a family interview. But... um, We may have to pause. We may have to stop to uh, help her out if she's having a little bit of a moment, but otherwise, hopefully, she'll be hanging out with us and just relaxed throughout the conversation. Um, So Vera was born on June 21st, 2022, and the reason why I wasn't sure if I was in labor that day is because I had been having... um, I guess they're called Braxton Hicks contractions over the weekend and my due date was Sunday, so Sunday the 19th, and I'd been having some contractions over the weekend, and I wasn't really sure if the ones I was having on the 21st were real. So I woke up around 5 o'clock in the morning, and I had pain similar to bad period cramps. So if you ever have had bad period cramps before, um, it wasn't what I thought labor was going to feel like, so I wasn't really sure if that was labor. I started to have contractions around, I think maybe like between seven and eight o'clock in the morning. It could have been a little earlier. Honestly, I kind of lost track of it because again, wasn't sure if it was labor or not. I had been having those Braxton Hicks over the weekend and um, didn't really know if that was actually something I should be paying attention to. So I wasn't really tracking it until about nine o'clock in the morning. At nine o'clock, my contractions were happening every about three to four minutes, which is actually pretty fast for the beginning of labor. <laughs> There's Vera. Um, so we were we were told that we should come into the hospital when my contractions were, what was it, three minutes apart? Yeah. yeah so they had, they had suggested three minutes. Yeah. So the fact that I started at three minutes apart was a little confusing. Um, The contractions themselves were only lasting about 45 seconds. I was using an app to time the contractions and they said, okay, when the contractions are three minutes apart and one minute long, 
um, then that would be indicative to come into the hospital. So that was part of the advice we got. But I had also gotten advice from other people, including my sister and friends, that said to try to wait until as long as possible to go to the hospital. And I think it was my sister that said, wait until you can't speak through contractions. And the contractions I was having at 9 a.m. that morning, that even though they were three minutes apart, they were not that bad. Like, yeah, they were uncomfortable, but I could definitely talk. I could walk. Like, there wasn't really um, a ton of discomfort there. So, again, I thought I might be in labor at that point because the contractions were consistently happening every three to four minutes versus over the weekend they were kind of more come and go and not as consistent. Um, So we started to make some preparations for the birth, but we also assumed that we would be home for a while. And I think a big reason for that was because um, a lot of our friends for their first babies, they were in labor for a pretty long time. Like I think you said, how long was your sister in labor for with her first? Yeah, it was like close to 48 hours. 48 hours, like so days of labor. And not that I expected to be in labor for 48 hours, but you know, most of my friends had said they were in labor for like 20 hours or 30 or something like that. So, and that was from the beginning of the contractions. Um, So I didn't necessarily expect to be in labor for 30 hours, but I was like, all right, I'm probably not going to be going to the hospital anytime soon. Um, The pain I was feeling was more of a discomfort. It wasn't like this intolerable pain. It was just uncomfortable. And I was getting into some different positions and, um, using, eventually I was using a TENS unit that my doula had given um, us to use during labor. And so I was using some basic comfort measures to, um, to just work through those initial contractions. Um, I also made sure I was eating and hydrating because I wanted to keep my energy up. I know a lot of people are told not to eat (laughs) while they're in labor, but um, labor is a very energy intensive experience. And you know, the the recommendation not to eat is questionable as far as if that's actually um, beneficial for women, especially if you're not going in for a planned C-section. Because a lot of times the reason why women end up getting C-sections or getting medical interventions is because they run out of steam during labor and they just can't really handle it anymore. And I think a big part of that is just being malnourished or dehydrated. So I was making sure I was eating, drinking, having electrolytes, that kind of thing to make sure my energy was um, kept up. So I forget, I guess it had been a few hours at this point. It was probably around like two in the afternoon. Um, I hadn't had my- that we had gone for a walk too. Did we go for a walk? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember everything. He he might have a different (laughs) level of memory than I do. Um, So I guess we went for a walk when I was in labor and I was probably stopping a lot right to like pause yeah we were pausing like for contractions Mm -hmm. um which i they didn't last very long at that point so you know short pauses and it wasn't a super long walk i mean maybe 15 minutes yeah and it was slow it was slow and we were going slow so um at that point i hadn't had my water break i hadn't had something called a bloody show which if you haven't had a baby bloody show sounds really scary it sounds like you're just gonna have this like tons of blood coming out of you but literally it's like imagine if you sneezed like mucus and there was a little blood in it like you know not a full bloody nose but like maybe you had a little irritation in your nose that's what a lot of women's bloody show looks like or the mucus plug um so I hadn't had that yet and I was having the contractions three minutes apart and um I wasn't sure I really wanted to go to the hospital if that hadn't happened yet now, whether or not that was the best decision, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, but it was something where I've heard a lot of women that they go to the hospital, they get a cervical check, and they're not very far along. Maybe they're a couple of centimeters dilated, and the doctor will recommend something called a membrane sweep, which is basically where they, like, take their hand and, like, sweep around the cervix to kind of um, disconnect the, I think it's the amniotic sac. I'm not a doctor, so this is my memory from learning about it for my own research. Um, but I've heard it's it can be very painful. It can introduce um, bacteria into the, uh, the amniotic sac. Um, it can kind of get things going in a way that's a little bit artificial 
from what I've seen. So I didn't want to do that because I felt that was, you know, when we're talking about avoiding interventions, that was an intervention I wanted to avoid. However, I did read that sex and specifically unprotected sex is an alternative to a membrane sweep. Um, there's actually something called prostaglandins in semen, which I know sounds like a lot of information, but, you know, we're a health podcast as well as a business podcast. So, um, those prostaglandins actually function the same as some of the, um, medications that a doctor would use to induce labor. So, you know, if you're going to choose between going into the hospital, getting a membrane sweep, maybe getting offered like Pitocin or something like that versus just having sex with your husband, that was a much more preferable option for me. So I think it was like early afternoon, we had sex. Part of that was to boost my oxytocin because again, oxytocin is the natural hormone that stimulates labor um, versus Pitocin, which is they give you, which, which is what they give you in the hospital to stimulate labor, which is an artificial oxytocin type drug. Um, it doesn't give you the same positive emotions or stress relieving benefits, and it can actually also make contractions really painful um, versus oxytocin stimulates contractions and also gives you a mood boost and also doesn't cause you to contract excessively hard. Um, so after we had sex, that was when I actually had the bloody show and I lost my mucus plug. I'd gone into the shower to do a little bit of laboring in the shower, and that's where my mucus plug fell out. So I feel pretty confident that the sex actually stimulated that. Whether or not it, you know, shortened my labor time, we'll never know, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did because, again, you go into the doctor and that's what they recommend to do more of in an artificial way. Um, so this was like early afternoon and I was starting to get more uncomfortable with the contractions, but I still was able to speak through them. So again, I had this mindset that like, I have to not be able to speak through contractions for it to be time to go to the hospital. Maybe wasn't the best mindset, but (laughs) that's what I thought was supposed to happen. Um, now I'd actually pre scheduled a chiropractor adjustment for that day. Um, I'd been getting adjustments for the last like six to eight weeks of pregnancy, mostly for just my own discomfort because when you're pregnant, you get really loose and things get out of place and you're in pain and your back hurts and, you know, your round ligaments hurt and all these different things can hurt, especially with your first pregnancy. Um, So I had been seeing the chiropractor twice a week at that point to just kind of keep things in the best um, position possible. Also, chiropractic adjustment can actually help with the position of the baby so that the baby can be in the best position for labor. Um, If you guys follow me on Instagram, you know that Vera was in the breech position until we went in for a external, um, oh my gosh, what is external? A version. Is it called a cephalic? Was it a cephalic version? It was an ECV. I think it stands for external cephalic version. I am actually forgetting just goes to show you what happens to your brain postpartum. But um, but basically it was a procedure in the hospital where the doctor like literally flipped her from the outside. Like she, you know, lifted her up out of my pelvis from the outside on my belly. And then her and the midwife like flipped her. And that was a really intense experience. That would be its own podcast episode to talk about that. But in that uh, procedure, I was under, well, I wasn't under anesthesia. I had anesthesia. I had a spinal block. Um, We were in the hospital for like 11 hours. So uh, it was something that we got her into the better position for birth. Um, The hospital I delivered at doesn't do breech deliveries if they can avoid it. So I wanted to make sure I wasn't going in for a C-section or having to drive 45 minutes to the hospital to go to a hospital that would deliver breech. So we did that um, version to get her flipped. And then I was doing a lot of stuff like the chiropractic, like spinning babies, different exercises to help get her into the best position for birth, which is where their back is to your belly button, basically. Um, And then their head is engaged in the pelvis. So that was a lot of explanation for why we were at the chiropractor. But I was actually having contractions while I was getting adjusted, and the chiropractor really just tried to get my pelvis to feel better. She was pretty gentle, didn't do anything crazy. I think she did a little bit of stuff to help with my nervous system. Um, 
But I just thought it was funny because I was, like, literally in labor on her table. Um, Now, I also had hired a doula, and I was texting with the doula a little bit, and I was talking to the chiropractor at our appointment, and they both had talked about, you know, especially for a first-time mom, that labor could go on for a really long time, and sometimes it could even go on for days. I mean, there's women that have something called prodromal labor, which is, like, days of labor. Um, And that was in my head, right? Like, I was thinking, I don't know, this could literally be you know, day one of three or something of having this experience. And I think from a mindset perspective, I was mentally preparing myself for it to go a really long time Um, and just like trying to manage it as best as I could at home until it was really something where I felt, okay, now it's time. So my um, doula had suggested that I try to take a bath and then take a nap afterwards to relax and just, you know, be as calm as possible. Um, which I did. And then when I was in the bathtub, my contractions actually started to get stronger um, to the point where I started crying because I was like, I don't know how long this is going to happen for. This could be for hours. I don't know if I can handle hours of this. There's a lot of stuff that goes through your head when you're in labor and you're like, I don't know how long this is going to be. And if you're type A like me, it's like extra hard because you want to know when is this happening? What's going on? What's, you know, what do I need to do? And birth was an experience where it was literally just like, You just got to let it happen and just take it contraction by contraction. Um, But I was kind of uncomfortable in the the tub, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to get out and um, just try to lay down and maybe take a nap. We'll see if I can sleep. Um, And Josh was helping me get out of the tub. And I think what happened when I got out of the tub was that the temperature change triggered some kind of hormonal response because when I was getting out, I started shaking like so violently to the point where I actually had to get on the floor because I thought I was going to like just collapse. Um, I don't know how you felt when that was happening because you were like observing it. Yeah, no, it was hard to really understand what was going on because in that moment you weren't really saying a whole lot. Um, Yeah, I could see that the shaking, but I'm like, is she shaking because she's cold? Is she shaking for some other reason? And yeah, it was just a lot of not knowing exactly what was happening. Um, But at the same time, just trying to um, help in the situation. Like, what can I do here? Yeah. I mean, I I was shaking so much that I was just like, I don't even know what's happening. And I was actually kind of getting like pretty stressed out by it because it just felt like, I mean, it was uncontrollable. I didn't feel like getting warm was helping. It was just this like crazy shaking. And, and I had had that kind of shaking when I was under anesthesia at our version. Um, it was worse when I was under anesthesia, but, um, it was similar. And that's why I was like thinking it was a hormone thing. Um, but it was like, I can't even tell you how much I was shaking and it didn't feel like shivering. It was like just these like full body shakes. So I had to kind of like just kneel on the floor in the bathroom until I could stabilize and, and get up. So by the time I was like relaxed, I had a bathrobe on. So I think, you know, my body temperature was back up and I felt like I could sort of relax, not like super relax. Um, but I got into bed and something that was really helpful for the contractions other than the tens machine, which I put back on after getting out of the bathtub was, um, we have this little handheld portable, um, what is it called? Theragun. Ther- Theragun? Is that the brand? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's like a portable massager that is, I'm like doing a shape with my hands. If you guys are watching the video, you can see it on the video, but with the podcast, um, it's just someone that's like a handheld portable massage gun and it's pretty powerful. Um, and anytime I was having a contraction, I would turn like, turn it on and push it into my hip bone. So like the top or the side of my pelvis, I guess, if I'm standing up straight and that shaking of my pelvis actually helped eliminate the discomfort for the contraction. So between the tens unit and the massage gun, um, and also kind of like the pressure, the counter pressure on my pelvis with the massage gun, that was something that at that point, you know, it didn't feel amazing, but it kind of like neutralized the pain of the contraction. Um, so I was like, all right, I guess I'm just going to like lay in bed and do this for a while. Um, 
Now, this is the part of the story where some of our decision-making probably was not at its peak. Uh, so do you want to tell this part? <laughs> yeah. So at, at this point, it was kind of like, okay, where, where do we go from here? What's, what's next? Like, how long is this going to be going on? Um, just a lot of questions that we had no idea how to answer. Um, I like think this was around like five o'clock. Uh, yeah, between four and five at this point. And so, you know, I'd been in labor for seven to eight hours, nine hours at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I was very much of the mindset, like, what should I do with myself? Like what I can't, I felt kind of, um, just not really helpful at that point or just like, I just need to let her rest and let her have some quiet and hopefully she can sleep and yeah, like just be kind of on call. Which I mean, um, to be fair, that would have, that would have been fine if you had been at the house and you were yeah. just letting me yeah. rest. Yeah. And at this point, I think we were both kind of of the mindset that Vera probably wouldn't be born until the next day. Um, at least I like that was kind of my mindset around it. Um, I thought we probably had a good 24 hours, maybe a little less, like maybe a little more. Um, so talking to Laura, I'm like, what would you like me to do? Um, I was supposed to have a softball game that evening. Um, like, do you want me to hang out here and just uh, be downstairs if you need me? Um, should I go to the game? Um, what What's your opinion? And I think at this point, uh, Laura didn't really want to say no to me in the situation or and didn't really share how she was feeling. Um, well, just to, to give some context, um, I mean, besides just being in labor and being like, you know, if you've ever been in labor, you probably know your mental state is not exactly like the most uh, cognizant, I guess. And it's pretty common for women that are in labor to do things that they going into labor said that they didn't want to do. So, you know, like asking for an epidural or something when you said going in, you didn't want it. So, um, so I think my decision making was probably not optimal at that point. And I had actually, uh, Josh had missed, he had a massage appointment scheduled at the same time as my chiropractor appointment. And I couldn't drive or, I mean, maybe I could have, but I definitely didn't feel comfortable driving. Um, and I didn't want to miss the appointment because I was like, that could actually help with my labor experience. So Josh missed his massage appointment. He had to pay for it because it was within a 24-hour cancellation or something like that. Um, and I felt bad that he had missed it. And I also, like Josh was saying, didn't know how long things were going to go on for. Um, so I was like, well, I don't really want him to go. And I was like internally thinking, I wish he wouldn't go. But I told him that, okay, it's fine if you want to go um, to this game. And, you know, other context is that the game was a 30-minute drive. <laughs> so, you know, if it had been a five-minute drive, I might have felt a little differently as well. Um but, you know, knowing that it was a 30-minute drive meant he would be gone for a minimum of an hour if he made it to the field. And then it was, like, the, le the length of the game. Usually there's, what, like a 30-minute warm-up or something and then an hour for the game. So all in all, like, a normal block of time for him to go to a softball game is, like, two and a half to three hours. Um, but he's a pitcher for the team. And so, you know, if he's not there, there's a – solid chance they could lose the game without him being there. So that was another thing where I was like, oh, I'll feel bad if he doesn't go and then they lose. And um, also, you know, if we were going to have the baby, I was like, I don't know when he'll be able to play again. So there's just a lot of stuff in my mind that was like very like guilt heavy to say no, even though, you know, my gut was like, no, I don't want him to leave. So I just wanted to give some context because like <laughs> this is a situation where it was, you know, it's not like he left without telling me or asked, and I said no, and he went anyway. Um, it was a situation where he asked, and I said it was fine. So you want to tell him how that went? So, I mean, yeah, in retrospect, it definitely took a situation that could have been a lot more chill and relaxed and made it a little more stressful. 
Um, so yeah, she's Laura said, go to the game. Um, and I was like, okay, that's sounds good. I'll do that. Well, and um, I said, and I'll I, call you. And yeah, you I'll said I'll call you, would you if call you need me. to come home. Yep. You would call me as soon as you needed anything or I should come home. Um, so get there. And my mindset is, all right, I'm going to keep my wa- Apple watch on me. Um, so I make sure I don't miss a call. Um, and I told the guys when I got there, I was like, Hey, I might have to leave during the game. I don't know. Um, the situation is kind of, uh, touch and go. Don't have any idea where it's, where it's headed at this point. It could be tomorrow. could be three days from now. <laughs> no idea. I'm guessing um, you didn't say could be in three hours or something, right? Um, well, I said I could, I might have to leave early. Yeah, so. but it wasn't like this might be <laughs> might be a bad idea that I'm here in the first place. Because <laughs> yeah. I feel like a lot of your guy friends, after the fact, were like, I can't believe he, you know, you let him go. Or, like, my wife would have killed me. And I was like, where was this conversation when you were there telling people that I was in labor? Like, I feel like nobody said anything. Like, maybe you shouldn't be here. Yeah, no. I don't, I don't think so. And there's no. a lot of dads on the team. So, you know, they've been through it. We hadn't. So. Yeah. <laughs> anyway so yeah game starts playing i believe it was third or fourth inning um uh, as i'm walking up to bat i start to get a phone call um so interesting timing because i'm like okay it's my time my turn to hit uh so i literally answered the call like right as the pitcher was about to throw the first pitch to me um so I'm talking on the phone with Laura, or answering the phone as I am trying to hit, um, which, needless to say, did not end well. Um, that pitch, I tried to hit it, missed terribly. Um, obviously, I was a little distracted, um, but everybody got a good chuckle out of it, needless to say, um, watching me with horrendously as uh, I'm talking on the phone, which... I don't think at that point anybody on my team realized I was talking on the phone. They thought I was talking to the umpire or the catcher. I don't know. Um, well, you weren't saying a whole lot, so. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was more just, hello, hey, what's going on? Uh, what's happening? Like, fill me in. Uh, so, anyway, yeah, I'm trying to listen, or basically listening to, <laughs> which the nice thing about hitting is you have your hands up closer to your face anyway. So, the watch is up close to my face while I'm holding the bat and um, second pitch it comes um, as Laura's I think had it basically started to have a contraction and so there wasn't any talking coming from her end so I go ahead and swing actually hit the ball um, end up with a double on second base which originally I was planning to stop at first um, one of my teammates is screaming at me because the person who tried to catch the ball like, totally muffed it, messed, messed it up, um, and was having trouble getting the ball thrown in to the infield. So they're screaming at me to run to second base, so I end up on second. Um, well, and for your guys' understanding, if he had stayed on first, he could have had somebody come in well, and I will say I'm a little surprised. Like if you had said my wife's in labor, I need to leave. What would they have been like? Sorry, it's an out. You can't have a runner come in for you. Yeah. And and looking back now, the umpire at the time of that game didn't actually know the correct ruling of the situation. Oh. Um, he said I couldn't have a pinch runner and it, I would be out if I left the field. Um, but actually, the correct ruling would have been that I could have had a pinch runner and everything would have been fine. Um, Oh, great. (laughs) But unfortunately, our umpire didn't quite know the rules very well. Well, even if that was a rule, I still feel like there's, you know, it's a church league softball game. Like you would think they could have had a little bit of understanding to be like, oh, okay, well, you're not just getting off to get off. Like you actually have to leave right now. Yeah. Um, Because, I mean, you were saying I was not talking. This was... (laughs) Literally, I was at the state where, okay, now I can't talk through contractions. And that was why I was like, all right, we need to, like, get him home. And um, because I had even called the hospital at that point because I was like, I feel like this doesn't seem like the kind of level of contractions that I should be 
tolerating at home at this point. And I honestly had no idea because, you know, most, well, I shouldn't say most, a lot of women talk about how painful uh, labor is for the whole thing versus it just being like the end of it or something. And I was like, maybe this is, you know, halfway through labor and this is how painful it is. So, um, but I mentioned to the um, osteopath that I was talking to, the DO, that um, was the, I guess she was the doctor on staff at that time. And she was saying, well, if you're needing to breathe through contractions, you should come in. And I was like, well, that was like hours ago that I needed to breathe through contractions. So um, that's why I called him. Cause I was like, all right, I really think he needs to come home and I, we need to get to the hospital like ASAP. So, yeah. So I'm standing on second base. Laura says, Hey, I think it's time for you to come home. I was like, all right, I'm going to get off the bases and I'm on my way. So literally next And by person. get off the bases, it means like continue playing until he could run home or get out or something. Yeah. Uh, at that point, there were two outs. So I'm like, okay, so next person's either going to, I'm going to score or the inning's over one or the other. So the next person actually got a hit. I scored. I yelled to my teammates, like, I have to go. Um, y'all figure it out without me. Um which they did figure it out. Uh, they ended up winning the game or con- finishing the game and winning. Uh, but at that point, I didn't really care. Uh, so jumped on the road, still on the phone with Laura and was talking with her on the phone um, all the way home from that point. Yeah. So now he's got a 30 minute drive to get home. Um, yeah, which seemed like I could do that faster most times, but got stuck behind a lot of slow traffic that day. Yeah. And in hindsight, thank God he didn't get in an accident or get a flat tire or something like that. Cause I would have had to, I mean, I would have just called an ambulance, but that would have been pretty bad if you had gotten stuck. Um, so anyway, I guess you get home and yeah. And the contractions are getting to the level where you wanted me like helping you through the contractions. Yeah, and by helping, um, the thing that was making them feel tolerable was, and by tolerable, it was still painful, but it was like, I can handle this versus, you know, peak pain was like, I don't know, I'm like, I, I'm trying to remember what it felt like because I think, you know, there's some level of design where women forget how much childbirth hurt or something because it's like, you know, I feel like it's, you would not want to do that again if you could remember the details. Um, but I was at the point where it was like, I needed him to apply counter pressure to the top of my pelvis. And what that does is um, you can't see what I'm doing with my hands, but basically by pushing on the top of your pelvis, the bottom of your pelvis opens because the it's like a lever almost. Um, so it can kind of like create a little bit of space where the cervix is and where the baby's head is. And so he was doing that, but then you also were gross and sweaty and bug spray. And I was like, I don't want him at the hospital yeah. like that. Like, you know, again, thinking it could be hours, it could be overnight, that kind of thing. So I was like, why don't you take a shower? Which, you know, maybe you could have showered at the hospital, but, yeah. um, but there was that. So we had to take a quick shower. And then also we had most of our hospital bag packed, but there was a bunch of little things that well, everything was packed. We just didn't have it in the car. Weren't there like some things that were hanging out? Well, everything was on the table. I mean, it might not have all been in the bag. It was not all in a bag where you could just pick the bag up and go to the car. Yeah. Um, there was a level of packing that had to happen. And in hindsight, we hardly used what, like, 70% of what was in that bag, probably. Right. Yeah, very few things from the bag actually got used. Yeah. So as he's packing the car and getting everything ready so we can get going, like, every two to three minutes I'm having this level of contraction that I'm like, screaming at him to come push on my top of my hips. Um, and I was like sweating profusely. I felt like I literally thought it was possible. I was going to give birth in the kitchen. Like I just, I don't know how to explain it other than it felt like my inside was like totally just like gaping open if you're a woman, you, you know, if you've had a baby, maybe you know what this feels like. If you haven't had a baby, I don't know if you can even imagine it because like, I don't think I would have been able to imagine it prior to having a baby, but basically it just felt like my whole, like 
like just inside through my birth canal was just like open. And actually it's probably what it was. Like, it, I don't think that was just how it felt. I think that's actually what it was. Um, but then I also felt this like really, really intense, painful pressure, like right on my pelvic floor kind of thing. So every time I had a contraction, it was like just ramped up like 11 out of 10 pain. Um, and I think for me, looking back, a lot of that probably was related to how stressed I was about, like, we need to get going, we need to get to the hospital, that kind of thing. And I think if I'd already been at the hospital or if we had been having a home birth, it's possible I might not have been in so much pain. Um, but because of the exact scenario, I think I was, like, having a lot of stress hormones that actually do create more pain because it increases tension and like anytime you have fear that increases tension, which then increases pain, which then creates more fear. And it's something called the fear pain or sorry, fear, tension, pain cycle. Um, so I think I got into that, unfortunately, for the last, you know, that hour or something when I was waiting for him to get home and getting the car packed and getting to the hospital. Um, but like the car ride, even I had, you know, I felt like it was probably her head, honestly, like pushing a ton of pressure into my pelvic floor, I had to like grab the handle on the roof of the car and like pull myself off the seat of the car while we were driving there. Um, and it was like literally the most pain I've ever been in my life, like by a long shot. I don't know if you want to share how you felt during that time. (laughs) On the upside, um, we, we, we live like five minutes from the hospital where Vera was born. Um, so that was a very ideal thing. Uh, so it didn't take us long to get there. Now, definitely wish we had had all of the stuff in the car already. Um, and also, like, there were so many things in there that we didn't necessarily need to, like, make sure we had with us when we went to the hospital. Um, well, but if so, it had been packed, if it had been, like, everything was just yeah, in there. Yeah, if everything there. was already in the car, it would have been whatever. Um, right. No big deal. Uh, but, yeah, not having that stuff in the car before I went to the game. Um, that's, that was probably the bigger thing. I should have just loaded that stuff in the car before I left, but I was like, oh, probably not again. I didn't think we were going to be having a baby until maybe the next day. So I was like, oh, I'll I'll get that stuff all in the car when I get home. Um, but yeah, that didn't happen. Well, I did get it in the car when I got home, but it was a lot more stressful and a lot more rush. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we could have saved like 20 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. I don't know. It felt like 20 minutes, but. But Maybe even 15 was, minutes. Yeah, it was definitely broken up between me trying to get some stuff in the car, but halfway to the car, I would need to come back and like, help you get through a contraction. Yeah. So um, so that was like mistake number two. So mistake number one was him leaving to go anywhere, really. I mean, it doesn't matter if it was a softball game. Like, just leaving the house with me being alone was probably the biggest mistake that we made that whole time. Not having the car packed was, you know, close second. Um And we hadn't wanted to have the car packed before because we use the car a lot and we didn't want to, like, have stuff out in the sun because it's, you know, June at that point in North Carolina. It's pretty hot out. I didn't want to have all this stuff that I had in there sitting out and baking. Um, So not putting the stuff in the car, you know, weeks ahead of time was fine, but I think we should have packed the car, like, you know, that afternoon, basically. Once we hit the due date, we probably should have went ahead and loaded the car. I don't know, though, because I could have gone another two weeks before having her. Yeah, like, we could have. But we could have also, like, taken it in and out of the car. Yeah, I, I think I would have just suggested it being ready to go, and then the day I start labor, put it in the car. Because mm. the car is in the garage, so it's fine, but it's like if we're right. driving it around a lot and parking in the hot sun, that was what I didn't want. Um, but, yeah, trying to get the car packed while I'm, you know— Screaming at him to help me through a contraction is probably not ideal. Hey there, Laura Schoenfeld here. I hope that you're enjoying our birth story so far. We're going to continue this story next week on the Fed and Perlis podcast. We're going to go into part two where we get to the hospital and things get a little bit crazy. So I hope that you'll join us. We'll also be talking about the lessons that myself and my husband learned throughout the process of not only giving birth to Vera, but also the first few months of postpartum and new parenthood that we've experienced so far. So there's a lot of juicy stuff coming your way next week. So I hope you'll join us and I'll see you
you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care. Are you a dietitian or nutritionist business owner that wants to create an online business that consistently brings in dream clients who actually want to buy your services, but you're struggling to figure out the right business strategy to get there? Then keep listening because I have a special opportunity that will help you create the highly profitable and impactful nutrition business that you always wanted. Inside my signature group coaching program, the Nutrition Business Accelerator, created exclusively for nutrition and dietitian entrepreneurs, you'll learn how to start, grow, and scale your online business to six figures and beyond so you can experience the financial and time freedom that you desire. I created this program to help struggling nutrition entrepreneurs get clarity on who they serve, how they serve them, and how they can stand out in a crowded market so that they can more easily attract dream high paying clients into their online nutrition business. This program is for brand new business owners and nutrition students, as well as those who have been in business for months or maybe even years, but aren't getting the traction that they'd like to see in their growth. Inside the NBA, you'll learn the most important foundational business building and marketing principles, not just the latest tools like social media, So that way you can experience sustainable business growth that adapts to the constantly changing world of online business. Over the course of 12 weeks, I'll show you how to attract high paying clients who are excited to work with you and willing to pay you the rates that you deserve. You'll get training on how to effectively sell your services in a way that feels authentic and converts prospects into paying clients without feeling pushy or salesy. And you'll get step-by-step instructions on how to create programs and services that provide truly transformative results, leading to glowing testimonials and referrals from your current clients, so you can have the greater impact that you desire in the world around you. You'll also learn how to manage your time, your energy, and your resources, so you can get more done in less time and experience the freedom that you really got into entrepreneurship for. When you apply what you learn in the NBA program, you'll never have to feel stuck or overwhelmed in your business again. Want to make this your reality? Then the Nutrition Business Accelerator is your pathway to achieve all of this and more. Get the proven strategy that has helped hundreds of business owners start, grow, and scale their nutrition businesses to five to $10,000 months and beyond, and accelerate your progress to build the nutrition business of your dreams. Go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash NBA to learn more about the program and get your name on the wait list so that you can be the first to know when our doors are open for our next round. That's lauraschoenfeld.com slash NBA, which is short for Nutrition Business Accelerator. If you have big dreams of running your own profitable and joy-filled nutrition business, you do not want to miss out on this one-of-a-kind business coaching opportunity. I can't wait to support you inside the NBA program.